Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Caitlin Ashcroft. Thanks for watching this video on Guide to Legal History and Historians, where we will be covering the chapters from the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins. There's a series or many different chapters here by different authors. So this is chapter 15 and chapter 16 by Katharina Isabella Schmid and Renisa Mawani, respectively. However, please note that these videos must not be watched in order. Any order works backwards, forwards, jump around, please do so. I prefer that, in fact. And yeah, without further ado, um, I'd like to oh, preface this one in that um, kind of don't torture yourself with the process. I've been taking these handwritten notes for all of my videos thus far but on this particularly Katharina's chapter was the longest in the whole textbook and I just had my birthday and then I had COVID and things were quite busy so I took for the first time ever I typed my notes I can write a lot faster and I, I thought why am I torturing myself all this way I'll probably go back to handwritten notes because I like to have it in my journal however I guess that's kind of my key takeaway or my key learning from this besides that which relates to legal history so, without further ado, we'll begin with Katharina Isabel Schmid, a little biography of her and her chapter, and then we'll do a comparison of the style of Plutarch's lives between the two. Not particularly because the two are directly opposed to each other, but rather because they fit together next to each other in terms of the textbook. So, without further ado, we'll start with Katharina Isabel Schmid. So, Katharina Isabel Schmid is a JSD candidate at Yale Law School, or a Doctor of Judicial Science uh, candidate at Yale Law School. She also is pursuing her PhD in history at Princeton University. She has a Master's of Arts in History from Princeton University as well, which she completed in 2017. She also has a Master of Law and LLM from Yale Law School, which she received in 2013. Her Bachelor of Civil Law from the University of Oxford, which she received in 2011. A Baccalaureus Legum in German and English Law from the University of Cologne, which she received in 2010. And a Bachelor of Law in German and English Law at the University of College London, UCL, in 2010. She also has a certificate in private international law at the Hague in Academy of International Law, which she studied between July to August of 2011. A little bit about the Hague Academy of International Law. They have a public and a private course to, I think, most commonly in the summer, and they're just very great international law opportunities or education. She's interested in why legal realism captured the imagination of American jurists, but seemingly never became part of mainstream German legal thought. Her books that are in progress, or articles that are in progress, Haskala in Hoboken, um, Ottilie Assing, Frederick Douglass, and New York's German Jewish Emigre Community between 1852 and 1884. It's an article in preparation and how Herman Kantowicz changed his mind on American and its America and its law between 1927 and 1934, also an article in preparation. She's also edited um, chapters in her edited collection, including this work and as well many shafts of insight, reading Herman Kantowicz's The Definition of Law, 1958, alongside HLA Hart's the Concept of Law, 1963, in Kantowicz's Berghoff der Rechts under Rechtsweisen Schaft, uh, published in 2019, as well she's done book reviews on such as Kevin Butterfield's The Making of Tocqueville's America, and Darren M. McMahon and Samuel Moyne were the editors of Rethinking Modern European Intellectual History. So a lot of already um, significant work under her belt despite still being in the pro process of completing her two doctoral degrees. So in terms of her chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, it's titled From Evolutionary Functionalism to Critical Transnationalism, Comparative Legal History, Aristotle to Present. So very exciting if you're really focused on the actual history aspect or the chronological history, this takes us through from Aristotle to the present. So in terms of her introduction, she opens up with Charles Donahue's bleak assessment of the field in 19, his 1995 lecture titled Comparative Legal History in a North America, a report in that comparative legal history can brief, ver 
can very briefly be summarized as I understand the term comparative legal history hardly exists in, place, in any place in the Western world today, which is a parochial outlook and known as or disciplinary solipsism and uh, due also due to its lack of critical perspectives. However, this chapter proceeds in three steps in this backdrop, the backdrop of his statement that it doesn't exist. First, it explores the practices of legal historical comparison from their beginning as an occasional element of ancient, medieval, and early modern treaties to their institutionalization as discipline at the turn of the 20th century. The second part makes a case for critical transnationalism as a way for legal historical comparativists to produce works that are both timely and interesting. And a third part will survey promising areas of and approaches to transnational legal research, all the while bearing in mind the particular challenge law poses to transnational history. So she's kind of not um, discounting Charles Donahue, but kind of contrasting with opportunities or a different path that it might take, and therefore that comparative legal history person does exist and perhaps and likely does have a place in the in legal research. So our second section is titled Historicizing Comparative Legal History. Part A on the abuses and of the uses and abuses of comparative legal history in modern times. So at the end of the century comparative historical arguments about law used by author, was used by authoritarians, first and foremost the Nazis, she says. Justification for forceful and it was caused for justification of forceful modernization of third world countries, and perhaps Donahue's conclusion that it was no longer relevant was a good thing. And but further back in time it was used to justify colonialism as well, subjugation and annihilation of non white, non Western, non Christian populations. And over the course of the nineteenth century, comparative legal history became the measuring rod of civilization. So there there has been a sort of negative use of comparative legal history throughout its history, supposedly. And at the end of the Cold War, it may have seemed to have ended the last vestige of this kinds of sentiments that had plunged the world into the two global conflicts. But Donahue neglected a number of compelling works being given around the time he delivered his report. Most prominently, James Q. Whitman's Comparative Historical Treatments of Shame Sanctions, car Carceral Punishment, Dignity, Privacy, Church-State Relations, Consumer Protection, and Pre-Modern Criminal Procedure. But Donahue still hints how problematic uses, that it can be problematic. So despite there being uses, despite Donahue perhaps missing some things, but it can be used wrongly if it's used to sort of um, elevate one society or over another or used to subject other societies. Part B, comparative legal history versus historically informed comparative law, so dividing, separating the two. James Gourley's Comparative Law and Legal History, the Oxford Handbook of Comparative Law, and published in 2006, says comparative lawyers and legal historians are not fellow travelers, but con in constant need of mutual support. So they both exist and they both need each other. And can, and, but it, in these two fields, it can be hard to distinguish, but it can be done. So this is where this history really begins. So in the beginning, this is part I, in the beginning was Aristotle, legal historical comparison in antiquity and the early middle ages. So politics written by Aristotle sometime in the fourth century BC, Aristotle elaborated on how the organization of political community could contribute to its citizens realization of life lived in virtue. So there's law can kind of impact this, the people and in doing so made reference to the constitutional law and history of 158 Greek city-states, so therefore comparative law. Particular interest is his Aristotle's construction of a relationship between constitutionalism and culture, so even included aspects of constitutionalism and culture which are were kind of almost forgotten for a period and then revived. Skipping ahead more than half a millennium, Late antique efforts to read Jewish alongside Christian Roman texts were kind of the next form of comparative legal history, where church fathers from Tertullian to Augustine would, were, would compare the two religions. So despite the maybe being posed against each other, it was an opportunity for comparative legal history.
such as the Adversus Judeos literature, which was intended to demonstrate that Jewish failure to recognize Jesus as the Messiah disqualified them from the kingdom of God. So it was kind of, once again, going to Donahue's argument, or perhaps why Donahue was perhaps, it was a good thing that Donahue was right, is that it was used to kind of suppress Jewish people, so used for poor reasons, but it was still nonetheless comparative legal history. Moving ahead to the fall of the Western Roman Empire, we encounter comparisons between Roman law and local customs, so another opportunity for legal history. Roman law was kind of the precursor to what we later have as civil law. Beginning in the late 15th, 5th century, classical legal learning in much of continental Europe gradually became replaced by Germanic codes, so still an opportunity for comparative legal history. The line of thought continued into the 11th and 12th century Roman revival when medieval jurists became concerned with rehabilitating classical Roman texts vis-a-vis -vis vulgar law and custom. So there was a systemic efforts established after the rediscovery of Aristotle sometime later, and it was a continuous practice of legal historical comparison was engaged. So despite once again using to suppress or change, it was still a process of comparative law, comparative legal history. Legal historical, next section, part II, legal historical comparison in the early modern English constitutionalist con tradition. So kind of on the other side, on the con common law side. Early modern English constitutionalists in particular were beginning to take a sustained effort in civil law, common law comparison. So on the common law side, they had comparative legal history by comparing common law to civil law. It was motivated by large concerns with socio-political differences and competition, and it sought to distinguish Anglo-Saxon liberties from continental despotism. John Fortescue, followed by Thomas More in his Utopia, famous book, and Christopher St. Germain and Thomas Smith are evidences of these uh, comparative legal historicists. Moving forward to Bodden and the Renaissance info lust. So following the exhaustion of the glossatory method sometime in the 5th, 13th century, late medieval jurists abandoned their scholasticism for a more pragmatic approach, resulting most italicus came to be criticized by 16th century humanists for their alleged distortion of original sources, and the hum humanists returned to historical, philological, and systemic methods to restore the original meaning of Roman legal materials. The mainstream humanists continued to uphold the corpus juris as a source of universal truths, and the early 16th century jurists associated with the most Gallicus sought to understand Roman law in its historical dimension. So a lot more in, during the time of the Renaissance, a lot more opportunities for comparative legal history as well. Jean Bowden, who is of particular note in this area, attempted to create a kind of gentium out of those legal building blocks where identical that were identical in every legal system. So seeing the commonalities across all these and in doing so insisted on the need to go beyond Roman law. I shall not mention the absurdity of wishing to draw conclusions about universal law from the law of laws of Rome. The only way to arrange the laws and govern the state is to collect all the laws of all the most famous commonwealths to compare them and derive the best variety. So kind of, I guess, a, a counter argument to the, the, it having a solely negative aspect. It wasn't just why is Roman law better than the others? It was taking the best from all, at least in Bowdoin's case. In Methodus Ad Facilum, Historium Cogit Cogitonum, published in 1566, it adapted Smith and Aristotle's, where Aristotle focused on Greeks, Asians, and Europeans, and typology of states. So they kind of, um, it is, it's not necessarily racist, but they were kind of typecasting different states. And after the 19th, well, Aristotle was to some extent a racist, but I don't know if we can necessarily say the same thing about Bowdoin or Smith as well, Adam Smith. After the 1942 Spanish crown in particular began taking an interest in indigenous ways of life, so another form of comparative legal history, and Peter Martyr's De Orb Novo, written between 1943 and 1525, civilized Europe for primitive, primitive cultures colonized cultures so used and living in a golden age without laws, without lying judges, and without books. So 
once again, sort of a negative sentiment, but still an opportunity for comparative legal history. Moving to Montesquieu, who I just started reading, or uh, The Spirit of Laws, an absolutely fantastic author, um, and the 18th century rise of the comparative method. So nothing served, uh, according to Schmidt, nothing seemed to serve as a stepping stone between Bogan's six, the six books of Commonwealth and Montesquieu's The Spirit of Laws. So there's a big jump, or kind of a big jump when we hit Montesquieu. Francis Bacon, Hugo Grotius, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, Samuel Kufendorf, and Christopher Wolfe drew on foreign materials but never made a temporarily and geographical, graphically comprehensive theatre of the legal world, as did Montesquieu. Montesquieu's work, published in 1748, The Spirit of Laws, set out to examine the relationship between geographic and climatic conditions, forms of government, and the spirit of the law. And like Bowdoin, applied both similarities and differences across a wide spectrum of peoples. Proto-evolutionary determinism, as well as proto-liberal relativism, became uh, prevalent here and made him a precursor of 19th century comparativism. Carolus Linnaeus, uh, in his Systema Natura, published in 1758, divided mankind into different racial varieties. George Cuvier began classifying animals based on their respective functioning organisms. Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin revolutionized geology and biology along similar lines using the comparative method against the background developments in the 19th century German legal science needs to be read. So a lot of these changes in terms of evolution and species classifications was also kind of perhaps influenced by those such as Montesquieu and the legal side. And yeah. Next section, chapter five, methodological debates in 19th century German legal science. Um, so Paul Johann Anselm Fobrach in Blick auf die Deutsche Rechtswissenschaft, published in 1810, supposed, why does the autonomous anatomist have his comparative anatomy and why does the jurist not yet have his comparative jurisprudence. After all, comparison and combination are, in empirical sciences, the richest source of all discoveries, which personally I would agree. Um, starting from Plutarch's lives, just comparing things is where I learn best. Frederick Carl von Savigny, who if you've seen my previous videos referenced, touched on questions of comparison in 1914 in this codification debate with Anton Frederick Justice Thiebaud. And the former na identified nationally idiosyncratic Volksgeist as the source of all law, no need for foreign law. And later, the ten sophisticated lectures about the constitution of the Persians and the Chinese would awaken in our students more of a truly jurisprudential sense than a hundred lectures about the, uh, the pathetic charlatan charlatanry underlying the law of interstate succession from Austin Augustus to Justinian. So what this quote really means is you can focus everything on J Augustus to Justinian, but it could be more meritorious just to have 10 articles covering from China to Persia, or different, a wider spectrum of peoples. George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel's notion of Weltgeist, jurists started thinking of different kinds of law as tied to or indicative of different stages of history. So another significant change from one who isn't, isn't traditionally, although he is much a legal scholar, he isn't traditionally thought of as predominantly a legal scholar. The most famous and certainly most interesting scholar writing in this tradition was Edward Gans, according to Schmidt. Neo Hegelian, who had Neo Hegelian roots, Gans criticized Savigny's microology and argued for a universal legal history. So um, Savigny was really the one who brought Roman law to Germany, particularly, or had that influence that caused it to rise in Germany. Um, so Edward Gans pushed away from this and dedicated to compiling the law of inheritance in a universal legal perspective, where he compared Indian, Chinese, Mosaic, Th Talmudic, Islamic, Greek, and Roman inheritance laws, and planned f further research on inheritance law in German and Slavic Middle Ages, as well as in modern times. However, he had a premature death and his work was continued on the shoulders of Karl Marx um, and Joseph Anton Maillet, and as well uh, Rudolf von Gering in the 1840s, a little 
had a little known attempt in pro-history, a prehistory of Indo-European peoples, as well as Joseph Kohler as an analysis of colonial laws and customs across geographies and comparative law, universal legal history, and ethnological jurisprudence. However, um, Gans was, according to Schmidt, probably the most impressive in this area, but he had a premature death, so it was kind of divided up and never completed, but many of these people contributed much in the areas that he was pushing for. Moving to chapter set, uh, six, the Anglo-American historical school. The Anglo-American legal scholarship in the second half of the 20th century largely followed European trends. It was influenced by German legal thought and with no small debt owed to contemporary social theory. Henry Maine argued that the movement of progressive society had been from status to contract, drawing on sources from Roman and Hindu law to biblical texts and Slavic, Germanic, and Irish legal materials. An ancient law published in 1861 contained a discussion on the early history of will, property, contract, and criminal law with a view of illustrating a move from primitivism to collectivism, primitive collectivism to modern individualism. His younger colleague, Frederick William Maitland and Frederick Pollock, less, were less pragmatic in their aim, but in the same evolutionary functionalism tradition. So once again, it's kind of, um, um, it, it has this underlying tone that the, the latter is better, the, that modern individualism is better from the primitivism, collectivism, which isn't necessarily the correct rhetoric. However, it was still a exercise of comparative legal history. Oliver Wendell Holmes, The Common Law, published in 1881, is on the other side of the Atlantic impressed readers with his sophisticated comparisons between the Anglo-American common and the Roman civil law traditions, as well Henry Adam Melville Bigelow and James Bradley Thayer and James Barr Adams similarly investigated Anglo-Saxon roots in American law. So that's kind of comparative legal histories from within. Uh, then to the chapter 7, the 20th century developments. In 1900, there was an important caesura in entangled history of comparative legal history and historically informed comparative law, which is in the summer, where the first World Congress of Comparative Law took place in Paris in 1900, and Edward Lambert's distinction between histoire comparative and legislation comparée, the two major fields, were the former with a professional study of the positive law to be undertaken by law professors and the latter a more theoretical and allied with the humanities and the social sciences. So there's kind of a big divide here between um, histor comparative history and legal comparison. This institutional separation that happened in France in 1900 with the diverging transdisciplinary connections then later the Nazis took an active interest in legal history, historical comparison and looked to American race legislation as an inspiration for their Nuremberg laws. They wanted to replace materialistic and value-free Roman laws with idealistic and value-laden Germanic law. Houston Stuart Chamberlain, a 19th century racial theorist who was actually from the UK but he moved to Germany and actually he was relationship or even married one of Wagner's daughters, I believe, traced everything undesirable and undramatic about Roman law to Jewish and other Oriental influences. So it's a very negative tone, but still a form of comparative legal history. After World War II, Paris comparative law clearly outpaced the interest in comparative legal history. The exceptions are scholars during the Cold War, such as René David, Conrad Zweigert, Hein Coates operated on the assumption that it was possible to divide legal systems into families, which was problematic because it was later picked up by a small group of American economists who were comparing the performance of common law versus civil law traditions just to show that the latter, civil law, underperformed economically. The World Bank even acted upon this by issuing recommendations reflecting common law regulatory principles. Mark Bloch, however, had a somewhat humoric conclusion that caustic collusion conclusion especially French law tends leads to good soccer which is a humorous comparison with respect to the FIFA World Cup comparison so like he says comparing civil law to common law based on economic grounds is you might as well com uh, com compare them on their implication on FIFA performances 
by the turn of the millennium, legal pra practices of legal historical comparison amassed a rather ambivalent track record. So now, what is happening now? Tr towards critical transnationalism in history and law. So pernicious uses of legal history com historical comparisons have been put certainly call for caution. They do not, however, suggest bankruptcy, according to Schmidt. The following suggests history is recent towards the transnational and should provide legal historical comparativists with a source of both optimism and inspiration. So it's not going to be necessarily a bad thing. And it is going on. Discovering the transnational in history. So comparative history took off at the same time comparative legal as comparative legal history as it had crystallized in Paris and it began disappearing as well. Henry Piren as the latter began disappearing. Henry Piren, Otto Hintz, and most famously Mark Bloch, who had a humorous quotation, made the case for historical comparison as a means of transcending the interwars, excessive nationalism, until rediscovery of historical sociology in the post-war period, period, comparative efforts lumped together with grand civilization narratives of Oswald Spengler and Arnold Toynbee. So they kind of took these international approaches to, as a means to unite the countries. St staging early, starting in the early 1960s, However, social scientists like Barrington Moore, Veda Skopkal, and Charles Tilley began using interdisciplinary methods to make comparative set statements on the origins of dictatorships, revolutions, and changes in the structure of social organization. So comparative history, at least briefly, was on the way up, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes bad reasons, but nonetheless, it was happening. With the rise of anti- and post-colonial studies in the 1960s, However, this new comparative history came, too came under attack by scholars of Latin America, Africa, and Asia who identified resistance to European and American imperialists, so it was seen as a way of trying to bring them under their hegemony as a process to transcend national boundaries, so they thought it was a way that they would take control. Michael Foucault's argument that power was ubiquitous, diffuse, and near impossible to pin down further distracted attention from the nation-state's real analytic centrality. Comparative history obscured rather than elucidated the insidious workings of power, so it just overcomplicates things, supposedly. Late 20th century works like Edward Said's Orientalism, published in 1978, and Dipesh Chakrabarty's Provincializing Europe, published in 2000, speak to the power in full influence the cultural turn exerted on historical scholarship and growing interest in processes of globalization and their implication for the writing of history. The end of the Cold War precipitated a move from Manichean bipolarity to global interconnectedness, where non-state actors made their presence felt in fields as diverse as human rights, terrorism, climate change, IT, maritime piracy, and financial regulation. So it was expanded in that sense. It's called a new globalization, where scholars turn to the study of heterarchical and interdependent networks, further sidelining centralized monolithic conceptions of power. So it's, it still managed to become um, transnational, despite some people thinking that it might be a way to create power. In fact, it might even be a way to diffuse power by diversifying it. David Thelen and Thomas Bender contributed to a toppling the prevalent American exceptionalism paradigm, furthermore strengthening this, where and as well Australian Ian Tyrell in its transnational turn. Daniel Rogers subsequently popularized both term and approach beyond American academic circles. Most transnationalists are principally concerned with denaturalizing the nation states as foundation, the foundational unit of historical analysis because it is less pernicious and focused rather on persons, objects, and ideas. Next section, discovering the transnationalism in law. So to this end, legal historians will be able to draw considerably on insights developed in other fields dedicated to the academic study of law. Plural, the pluralism debate in legal sociology, anthropology, and theory, and the transfer debate in comparative law, and the immersion debate in cultural legal studies dovetail nearly with the turn to the transnational in history. So there's the, these three trends that um, will 
align with the transnational history or help us discover the transnational history, starting with the first denaturalizing the national state, the legal pluralism debate. So like the move away from methodological nationalism, the move away from monistic conceptions of law has multiple genealogies. Legal pluralism lurked in the background of early anthropological works like Maine's ancient law and also post-colonial studies, but it received less traction. The same holds true for legal pluralism's sociological strand, commonly traced back to Eugen Ehrlich, drawing on experiences of his youth in the multi-ethnic Boko Bokowina region. So essentially the theory is drawing on Nicholas Luhmann's theory of system as autopoiesis, Gunther Tobman's proposal of reinterpretation of legal pluralism as a bit debate not about groups and communities, but about discourses and communicative networks. So by invoking this legal pluralism, we can kind of denaturalize the nation state and kind of get this common law, not you know, to reference actual common law, but common law across different states or legal pluralism cause overlapping is a good way of describing it. And then the next would be from boring to irritants, the legal transplant debate. So there's the pluralism and then there's transplant. The legal transplant was popularized by Alan Watson, who in his 1974 book on the same name made the following two arguments. First, that legal transplants are known as legal borings, also known as legal borings, constitute the most fertile source of legal development. Second, that such legal transplants or legal borings occurred without too great difficulty because more often than not, a particular legal rule exists independently of society, so they can easily be transferred and it have been made to govern. After almost two decades of relative silent reception, the second publication in 1993 provoked ear the ear of postmodern comparativists. So postmodernists such as Pierre Lagarde wrote in his 1997 article titled The Impossibility of Legal Transplants, so shortly after at Watson, arguing that as rules move from one interpretive community to another, they inevitably change, so they cannot be transferred. So there's a spectrum of the debate between Watson and postmodernists like with Pierre Lagarde, but I think to some extent there can be transplants. Maybe they get changed a bit, maybe they get changed a lot, but I think it's it does exist, and that you can't take the entire postmodernist argument. Third, loss in translation, the legal immersion debate. So the question at the heart of the immersion debate concerned the proper role of the legal historian vis-a-vis -vis her subject matter, a development that mirrors transnational historians' emphasis on epistemological self-scrutiny, with some postmodernists less directed at Watson, uh, like Rudolfo Sacco wrote the notion of Cryptotypes, in that it must be admitted that some expressions are untranslatable. Nevertheless, scholars of legal culture have formulated compelling arguments in favor of at least some degree of translatability, such as Walter Benjamin, Homi K. Bhuva, Chakrabarty, and Lena Foligianti recently called attention to the originality of legal comparison. In particular, by, in particular by suggesting cultural translation as a metaphor for emphasizing legal transfer's creative and procedural dimension. So by translating it, you actually can create new things. Michel Grazi-Zade says it's a his, his holistic approach to legal cultures. Vivian grossfield Curran in Europe, said the European emigre jurists in the United States whose work contributed to the rise of American comparative law during the early Cold War years. One, um, they moved there, so there's, that's a kind of a way of that translation by people immigrating. But one should not underestimate the difficulties of these European emigres jurists based in the United States. And uh, Schmidt notes, perhaps they were thus perhaps not so much of two legal cultures as merely in two legal cultures. And there's more of a, um, there's still translation and immersion still exists, but maybe they didn't get fully immersed in the latter, or maybe they lost the former to some extent, but it's still an opportunity. From evolutionary functionalism to critical nationalism, transnationalism, section C, as we've seen histories turn to the transnational through these means, it closely mirrors the developments in anthropological, sociological, theoretical, comparative, and cultural study of law. Scholars interested in legal historical 
comparisons might thus benefit from combining the resulting insights into a workable approach of their own, and should, be, but they should be critical, however, and Schmid suggests that they focus on the discipline on, of the movement, friction and resistance, rather than on the status quo perceived as inherently fixed and smooth. So interesting to know what is slowing it or what is causing these resistances, not necessarily what is driving it. Next section, and this last se section before the conclusion, five impulses for the future of research. So following five suggestions are meant to further move practices of legal historical comparison into the direction of what she calls critical transnationalism. And it's drawn from recent developments in both law and history. So the first one, exploring the origins of absent ideas. So Samuel Moyne in On the Non-Globalization of Ideas, published in 2013, says for every concept that does not globalize others, for every concept that does globalize, others do not. So in her own research, she looks at why realistic jurisprudence failed to take off in early 20th century German legal science while fundamentally changing American legal thought in the 1920s and 1930s. So looking at these absent ideas. Next section, second one, pernicious ideas and approaching also must focus on bad ideas. Pierre Yves Sunier in Learning by Doing notes on the making of the Polgrave Dictionary of Transnational History published in 2009. He diagnosed a prejudice against evil in the study of transnational civil society. So you gotta look at the bad or the evil ideas as well, resulting in historical blind spots. Recent works in slavery and racism is illustrate the timelessness of studying evil and the transnational transnationally and should be taken as models for future works in the same vein so just because it's a tough topic to look at racism and slavery that doesn't mean they're not all the more important the third op uh, uh, suggestion comparison as historians category and com versus the comparisons as actors category so there to the extent there exists a syllogistic no not only between positive moral value and transnationalism but also between positive moral value and law, legal historical comparativists should contribute to its undoing. In this regard, they would benefit greatly from employing comparison not only as a historian's category, but also as an actor's category, so focusing on the individuals and kind of in the style that I focus on these chapters, I focus kind of more on the authors rather than necessarily too much on their subject matter. I could have divided it up by the chapter names, but I chose to divide it by the authors. Michael Siegel, in his comparison, serves as a better subject than method as well. Historians ought to focus on the comparative judgments of their actors rather than simply engage in comparisons themselves. Comparison of actors, as much as style to judge lives. David Rabin's Law's History, American Legal Thought, and The Transatlantic Turn in Hit to History, published in 2012 where through comparison between German-American jurists, he argues Holmes, Roscoe, Pound, and others either willfully or by accident created a transatlantic formalism myth. The fourth option, suggestion, recognizing the multi-directionality of ideas. So given the additional layer of confusion that cloaks ideas with every new cross-cultural transfer, legal historical comparatives should move beyond the unidirectional flow of legal and quasi-legal phenomena, it's not just linear, and, and that's, I think, the, much the design of this textbook as well, uh, and pay attention to the multi-directional and especially retrogressive forms, so also looking backwards or what's slowing things or moving things backwards. Udi Greenberg's The Weimar Century, German Emigres and the Ideological Foundation of the Cold War, published in 2014, exemplifies this point in that five German following five German jurists who, due to their political commitment or Jewish background, left Germany for the United States, so kind of a regression, and all five went on to introduce liberal democratic concepts into American Cold War politics and culture, so what caused them to diverge from their national country is form a multi-directionality and could have paid more attention, however, to si those similarities between his protagonists that resulted in their shared experience as products of German legal science and education. So uh, Schmidt thinks he could have done a better job of comparing these individuals. And the last one, contributing to knowledge, uh, to the global history of knowledge, Jean-Louis Halperin recently mourned the absence of a robust tradition of historical sociology of law, calling for a renewed history of lawyers.
what is called the legal mind is not something timeless and identical but variable in combination of legal education i think it's along the lines of intellectual legal history of the social backgrounds of jurists and of the professional projects supported by mobilized groups just as the history of science has recently been widened to include more encompassing history of knowledge the history of law may also be conceived as part of a larger history of normativity it would be interesting indeed to focus on how lay communities subvert resist shape appropriate and navigate foreign legal processes so cultural bottom-up approach more commonly employing comparative historical perspectives especially in the context of migration would thus substantially enrich the, both the social and intellectual history of law so by combining it essentially with other fields would be the last suggestion so in terms of our concluding remarks laws challenge to transnational history she says, questions remain about the challenge the law poses to the transnational history. The arguments could be made that pluralist and postmodernist critiques, notwithstanding law, is inextricably intertwined with the nation state. So perhaps there is no opportunity for this, according to the uh, arguments against the pluralist or the postmodernist, and that the state is constituted and constitutes its subjects through law, and that the, the people don't create the law, but the state creates the people essentially and exigencies of time and space prevent her from exploring this argument as part of this chapter so she's not going to necessarily address this directly but she suggests that transnational historians ultimately stand to profit from any challenge legal historians might in the future throw their way so um, first they had she doesn't and i don't think it's true and this is an opportunity for research so that is her chapter moving on to the slide content picture of her institution Yale Law School position doctor of judicial science candidate she's also doing her PhD in history at Princeton University moving to her research interests legal realism contract law tort law comparative law constitutional theory private law theory Anglo-American legal history European legal history legal theory and philosophy legal sociology and anthropology critical legal perspectives on legal education and the legal profession, law and literature, transnational intellectual history. Images, University College London, where she received her first law degree, University of Cologne, where she received her second law degree, uh, uh, Oxford University, where she received her Bachelor of Civil Law, Yale Law School, where she, and Princeton University, where she, uh, she is studying at both. Suggested readings, Haskala in Hoboken, Ottilie Assing, Frederick Douglass, and New York's German Jewish Emigre Community, 19, 1852 to 1884, article in preparation, and how Herman Cantor Warwick's changed his mind on America and its laws, 1927 to 1934, article in preparation. Her chapter is in Approaches, Conceptualizing Legal History, chapter 15, the, From Evolutionary Functionalism to Critical Transnationalism, Comparative Legal History, Aristotle to Present. Her quotes, to be sure, Donahue's contention that comparative legal history hardly exists any place in the Western world today is problematic, which is kind of the focus of her chapter. And insights by comparative legal history have been an integral to rhetoric on both sides of the Iron Curtain. They also serve as justification for the forceful modernization of the third world countries around the globe. So there is the negative consequence happen. The pernicious uses to which legal historical comparisons have been put certainly call for caution they do not however suggest intellectual bankruptcy like that quote and i would suggest that transnational legal historians ultimately stand to profit from any of the challenges legal historians might in the future throw their way so that is isabel uh, katharina isabel schmidt very fascinating and very uh, young also intellectual so i think we'll see a lot more and i uh, encourage you to follow her as well i know i will so moving Next to Renisa Mawani and her respective chapter, which is in section two, Approaches, Conceptualizing Legal History, same section, chapter 16, Archival Legal History Towards the Ocean as Archive. A little bit about her biography. So she's a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of British Columbia. She's also a recurring chair of the Law and Society Program at UBC, as well as a faculty associate at the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies 
and at the Social Justice Institute at University of British Columbia. She received her PhD from the Center of Criminology and Sociological Studies at the University of Toronto. She's, her research follows into two tra 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 trajectories, according to her. One meets at the inf interface of critical theory and legal history and is aimed at histories of colonial dispossession, aimed at indigenous peoples and restrictions imposed on Asiatic migration. Her book, her first book, Colonial Proximity, is published in 2009, and Across Oceans of Law, published in 2018, which covers the SS Komagatu Naru, are both in this stream, as well as Enemies of Empire. Her current book is on the maritime aspirations of two anti colonial figures, are in this stream. Her second set, Legalities of Nature, coalesce at the juncture of science, law, and history. And which is a central concern is how colonial violence has been imposed and legitimized through racial, legal, civic, and static claims to nature, identity, and wilderness. Some of her chapters in this area are Insect Wars, Bees, Bedbugs, and Bipolitics, published in the Rutledge Handbook, or Rutledge Handbook of Law and Theory, as well as Bee Workers and Expanding Edges of Capitalism, the fund fundamentalist, fundamentalist Papers. Um, kind of a play off the Federalist Papers, I think. Uh, SHRC, the Shirk, it's called Insights Grant. She received for her book, Enemies of Empire. She also received a Hampton Research Grant Award for her insect jurisprudence piece. And Across Oceans of Law, her book, was a winner of the Association for Asian American Studies History Book Award, as well as a finalist for the Sociological Association of the United Kingdom Theory and History Book Prize. So her chapter is called Archives, Archival Legal History Towards the Ocean as Archive. So she opens up with my deepest gratitude to Stefano Pantalone for the many conversations that helped shape the ideas here and for sharing her unpublished work and for his feedback on an earlier draft. Many thanks to Chris Tomlins, one of the editors of the book of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History for his helpful commentary on the previous version of the chapter and especially for reminding her of what she had forgotten. I'm not sure what that is, but I think it's something personal between the two of them, but it's nice to see the camaraderie um, both between these two individuals, but also throughout the book, it seems they're all very collaborative together. So her introduction, she opens up, there's a quote, the sea is history by Derek Walcott, and then another quote by Fred Daguerre, the sea is slavery. So in the beginning of Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route by Sadia Hartman, it introduces her readers to the elusive contours of the slaver's archive as the archive contained what you would expect. The manifests of slavers, ledgers, books of trade, goods, inventories of foodstuff, bills of sale, itemized lists of bodies alive, infirm and dead, captain's logs, and planter's diaries, filled with documentation of commercial transaction and fitness or unfitness of bodies of commodified as cargo. Despite the abundance of records, they say little about the African men, women, and children who were captured horrifically from what was then the Gold Coast. And to enter in this text is like to enter into a mortuary. The archive of enslaved and an exercise of futility. With the remainder of inadequacies of all official archives particularly the transatlantic slave trade. So it's essentially they're treated as though they're dead and have no personality. Viewed from the fields of law and legal studies, discussions raise additional questions on the limits and possibilities of legal archives. So if they weren't treated as humans, how much they can they tell us in this area? Law made limits on the slavers' archives. So law also caused these limits as well. Example, the African captives who were bound, bound to plantations were not even permitted to write or represent themselves, though some did, such as Jack Dorita's Archive Fever. To speak of slavery's archive is not only to speak of silence, it is to locate the force of law in white power. So there's two things here. We cannot get find out too much about the law because it was um, they, they, they were not even treated as people, but also law caused this as well. David Kanzigen, in his Freedom Surprise article, that other European and indigenous languages have been the source to learn more about this. 
it, it has caused a plurality of archives so looking at not just English sources has helped it, and therefore we not necessarily view it as a death sentence so there might still be some opportunities here Christina Sharp in what calls this wake work which is a strategy of reading writing and thinking that generates alternative sources from the hegemony of Anglo-American narratives such as Sharp and Kanzigen both suggest a return to the sea. This chapter builds on her earlier work, Law, Law's Archive, where it explores how law writes its authority and legitimacy through a double logic of violence, the violence of law and the violence of archive. The remainder of the chapter reconsiders these dynamics of presence or absence and preservation or destruction through the, legal, the ocean as legal archive and it argues not empty but filled with te legal text, objects, and artifacts. So well, other through looking at objects and artifacts as alternatives. It from essentially from the 16th century onward, the ocean has never been vacant. And it shows in the final section that the ship and slave are deeply entangled with the concept of personhood. It's very fascinating, also you'll see soon. Though they may not fully recover the lost subjectivities of those enslaved. They may draw attention to the foundational role of slavery in the development of modern law and, the, and point to other imaginative possibilities in writing of archival legal history. So how have they influenced laws on the mainland as well? So all very exciting in laws of personhood. So uh, section two, objects, artifacts, and archives. So all her chapters have a little quote at the beginning. So bones soldered by coral to bone, mosaics mantled by the benediction of sharks shadow. Poem. So Michael Foucault's Archaeology of Knowledge, the document is no longer for history an inert material which, which it tries to reconstitute what men have done or said, the events of which only the trace remains. Rather, history is now trying to define within the documentary materials itself unities, totalities, series, and relations. So not a text on law or history's archive, but as a critical method and orientation of archaeology, draws attention from the textual content to forms of speech. Not the sum of all texts, but that a culture has kept upon its person as documents attesting to its own past. Therefore, archive is first the law of what can be said. It differentiates discourse in the multiple existence and specifies them in their own duration. So an archive is not a place, text, or record. It is a discursive structure that initiates, arranges, and enables systems of enunciability. So a very, essentially, long way of saying there's, you can't just look at text, and it also kind of has a feedback loop. So once it's in text, it causes further text as well, and causes, influences action. The responses to Foucault's reflections primarily from historians to anthropologists, some legal scholars such as German media theorist Cornelia Bisman, pathbreaking book Files, argues that law and legal studies has had little to say on the substance of law and that there's a lack of reflection on their tools. Law and files mutually determine each other. So this is sort of feedback loop. In her own work, Anissa Marwani's work, Law's archive builds on these ideas and aspires to move the conversation away from document and files towards the outlines and effects of Law's archive. Argues Law operates through a double logic of violence, the violence of Law and the violence of archive. So it wants kind of feedback loop restricting it. Through the preservation and destruction of files and documents, Law creates itself as a legitimate form of command. So it's feedback loop. In, her, in a recent essay on the Court of the King's Bench, Paul Halliday stated, Law, stuff of law, cannot be captured in writing alone, therefore move from files, advocated for a move from files to things, not judge or legislator who produced the recorded law, but often focusing, uh, in fact, the, the minor law clerks even wrote it, so it's not even necessarily what the legislator or the judge wanted as well. Focus on places and occupied by people doing work as well. So what was actually happening in these rooms or what was um, not necessarily just what was written. Trissa Luker has what she calls counter-archives, 
such as colonial bureaucracies and political challenges affect the creation of archives what was not written so which is like bureaucracies preventing or political challenges prevented things from being written so like the boundary of the establishment of written laws in terms of things antoinette burton in has her archive of bones published in 2003 what is left in the wake of Auschwitz, Vietnam, Serbarenica, Ayodhya, Colombo, Brasa, 9-11, and Tora Bora is the de de detritus of history, fragments and shards, ashes and dust, rag and bones. So there's only, it's not, it's all broken down essentially. The kinds of testimony that living witnesses cannot provide despite, and of course because of their pathos, of their memories so even people who can speak about it often have it hidden because they cannot it's too traumatic to speak of ocean as a legal archive is material figurative and human and non-human many surfaces layers and dimensions with analogy because it is ocean that demonstrates the materiality of law and legal violence in a productive way from the 16th century onward precisely because of the inherent difficulties of mapping knowing and navigating the seas of the Atlantic crossing produced novel and bountiful forms of legal writings, such as maps, ledgers, lists, ship manifests, registries, commercial transactions, diaries, and maritime fiction. So all of these must be considered part of the source of law, the body of law. Much more non-visible that emerge and re-emerge, surface and submerge. So some things are only available and some things have been lost as well. A turn to the dynamic sea must displace and even disrupt the long-standing textual emphasis on archives as sites of death, destruction, and violence, while inevitably new ways to imagine the past and history. Oceans have long been competing sites of oppression and redemption, she says, subjection and subversion, undulations that are vividly evident in histories of transatlantic slavery, which is the focus or we'll focus on for this chapter. Marine archaeologists have successfully retrieved artifacts from shipwrecks and maritime disasters, which have helped provide additional sources, and they've been used to date events and establish specific rhythms, patterns, and resistances to transatlantic slavery as the detritus of an early global racial capitalism. Maritime objects offer further insights into slavery's historical, contemporary, and ongoing effects. So just to kind of reiterate, they've these laws actually influence capitalism itself on the mainland as well. As we'll see, Edouard Glissant said the ocean is a space that has no identifiable beginning or end, and it underscores the foundational place of transatlantic slavery in the development of modern law. So not only it, it, it affects the mainland as well, or land as well. Ocean as legal archive presents objects and artifacts that push beyond the limits of slavery's archives, including its partial and uneven truths. So, section, section, second section, the ocean as legal archive. So, the quote here is, but the ocean kept turning blank pages for history, by Derek Molko. As an archive of law and history, oceans present a paradox. Both historically and in contemporary accounts, they're viewed as limitless, empty, and unknowable, unlike land, which has legible hi history of law and politics inscribed through territory, real borders, and divisions. So there's one has limits, the other is unlimited. The sea is perceived, therefore, as an anti-archive, so what is outside of law, outside the forces of legality and history, often no man's land, perhaps. Carl Schmid, The Nobos of Earth, in International Law of the Just Public and European, the earth is bound by law in three ways, as a reward of labor, as fixed boundaries, as a public sign of order. So fixed boundaries do not apply to the ocean. The sea knows no such apparent unity, such apparent unity of space and law, of order and orientation. Vessels that sail across the sea leave no trace or wave that there is nothing but waves. According to Alexis Wick, what better locus to rethink about history for the problematic of space, time, and historical objects than the sea? In his The Red Sea in Search of Lost Space, published in 2016. So it's quite problematic and almost a paradox. That it, over the past decade, the oceanic turn has invited additional sites, sources, and objects of historical analysis. To start, the 
ocean features a recurring metaphor in descriptions of archival and historical studies, such as researchers often characterize themselves as navigating archives, so the ocean of normal archives, and sifting through a sea of information. So if we apply these oceanic metaphors or analogies on land-based sources, then it must be true also that there must be a sea of archives in the sea itself. Her term, Oceans as Method, offers an alternative mode of reading, writing, and composing histories, one that privileges movement and mobility while expanding beyond constraints of land and territoriality. Ian Chambers' Mediterranean Crossing, the sea, promotes adoption of a more fluid cartography in which presumes stability of a historical archive together with its associated facts and interpretations is set to float. It's susceptible to drift, unplanned contracts, and even shipwrecks, so laws can completely be obliterated. The sea, like history and memory, is constantly moving and exceeds geographical boundaries and temporal frames. Some have used to disrupt the linear chronology of slavery, such as, so, looking at it less linear by applying a multi-level analysis. Ian Bocom, building on what Walcott, Gleason, Dogrier, and others built a counter archive of slavery through his means in that the Atlantic calls into questions prevailing territorial divides and chronologies of history's spectres, spectres of the Atlantic commences with gap in the archive. With the unacknowledged petition sent by Granville Sharp, a British abolitionist, to Lord Commissioner of the Admiralty, so some things are mysteriously missing as well. By way of conclusion, the next section, section four, uh, considers how the ocean as legal archive might help to foreground the foundational role of transatlantic slavery in the development of modern law. Specifically, she begins by with tracing its endurance in the conjugal, conjoined juridical status of the ship and slave as legal persons. This is really most very fascinating to me. And the metaphysical and magical processes by which law makes the inanimate, animate, and animate inanimate. So, section four, see as legal hi as legal history of slavery. So this is the last section, and really where it all comes together. So the quote here is, that was just Lamentations, it was not history, by Derek Walcott. Oceans, as she argues throughout, are not empty, nor are they sites of lawlessness, disorder, or anarchy. Rather, legally produced and arranged as distinct spaces, such as there were territorial waters, contiguous zones, economic zones, and the high seas, which would be the no man's land. The first three, depending on the proximity to territorial boundaries, fall within jurisdiction of sovereign nation states. The high seas, by contrast, cannot be controlled or occupied by any one sovereign power. Although nation states have jurisdiction over the ships that fly their flags and traverse ocean regions, as a legal domain, the high seas falls within the realm of international law. One of the most significant contradictions in designing the high sea uh, as a common space, Nicholas Mizuoff argues the sea in his article, The Sea and Land by Power in the Visuality of Slavery to Katrina, published in 2001, what, uh, yeah, 2001 was the use of free oceanic trade to transport people as unfree property or slaves encouraged an unprecedented form of racial violence deemed necessary to law's metaphysical process of transforming people into property so it was really it wasn't when the slaves arrived in the slave receiving country most commonly the united states but when they got on the boat that they officially became slaves and maintained that through the high seas through no man's law so that's really the inception there are overlapping laws as well such as but whereas indigenous laws were seen as less than european laws which were often seen as less than british or american laws the british navigation acts in 1677 required all plantation commodities including slaves be transported on british vessels and second specified legal status of slaves as property it's Quote here, Negroes ought to be esteemed goods and commodities within the acts of trade and navigation. Maritime standing of slaves as property informed their legal status on land. So once because they, they, by some sort of necessity, had to be seen as property for the transport, 
when they arrived, they were already being commodified. Slaves only regarded as legal persons when they transgressed the law, and otherwise they were reduced to trans to commodities, denied history, name, or culture, and this was largely for business reasons. The British maritime customs, ships were regarded as not as inanimate objects in contrast, but as living persons. They were this is foundational for modern corporation laws, where corporations are seen as persons as well. Commonly described in anthropologic terms, moods and personalities, you see like, oh, there she glows, for example, and dispositions that could protect or imperil a captain or sea at crew. By the 1800s, under the U.S. ship law, ships acquired status of independent juridical persons, fictionally animate beings incapable of contracting or capable of contracting commu committing offense and by unique admiralty process subject to arrest, condemnation, and forfeiture of wrongdoing. So uh, these, they're treated largely like people. Responsible for debt, so uh, the, the way I understand ships, uh, according to Moby Dick, which is actually an absolutely fantastic book, people buy equity in a ship, but for example, if the ship sinks, then people don't get, they, there's no person that they can sue to get their money back, it's the ship's fault. So when the ship goes bankrupt dies essentially I'll, and this allowed the u.s codes to expand their jurisdiction across the seas by making decisions about vessels that flew an american flag but were anchored and detained for waters so if it was an american ship for example that was an american person so they allowed them to expand their authority the legal personhood traced the US, u.s supreme court judges chief justice john marshall and justice joseph story and interestingly, they also decided cases involving the legal status of slaves. So on one hand, they were commodifying or one, the real people and turning ships into uh, non-real people into real people. For example, in 1942, Prigby, Pennsylvania, Justice Story, who previously made important judgments concerning the legal personhood of ships, defined a slave as property when Edward Prigg was accused of kidnapping a fugitive slave that he... T that, um, and he took him with him back to Maryland, uh, that ran away to Maryland, and he took him back, and uh, or he captured him in Pennsylvania, pardon me, and it, that violated Pennsylvania's personal liberty law. However, in Ram, he could exercise the right over his property, despite it being in Pennsylvania, for runaway slaves. So on one hand, a, a, a ship is becoming a real person, by the story, and then on the other hand, a slave, back on the mainland, is... Uh, a person a, um, is a possession and even um, overpowers Pennsylvania's state laws. If ships were legal persons, they could be arrested and condemned. Slaves were forms of movable property. However, ironically, they became legal property, uh, legal persons when they violated a law. So only when they could be arrested and condemned. So until they actually commit a crime, then they're considered people and then they can be punished. The problem was addressed directly in Fugitive Slave Act in 1950, where Jonathan Guttoff said the provisions of the notorious Fugitive Slave Act, which required the rendition of runaway slaves and the provided for the punishment of those who aided them, appear to have been mo modeled on provisions of the Merchant Seamen's Act of 19 1790, which dealt with the problem of ship jumping sailors. So, ship jumping sailors could be put to death. So that kind of expanded into slavery is where they could pick them up as well. It's kind of mutiny, or not, not mutiny, but people uh, run away, essentially, from their boats. And these are convincing arguments on how the laws of land and sea were joined through slavery. So they're like, mm, we can do this to people who run away the ship. Why can it not be done to slaves who run away? Um, there is still no denying, however, that the legal regimes under which enslaved Africans and merchant seamen toiled were very different. So although, yeah, they were Anglo-Saxon perhaps you know, runs away from a ship and then he could be brought back, that, but it was still much worse to be an actual slave in the United States. In Jack Derrida's Archive Fever, he says the afterlife survivance no longer means death and the return of the specter, but the surviving excess of life which resists annihilation. So where do these slavery laws still exist in society? So the survival of the most triumphant and vital elements of the past, so some of the worst perhaps still exist points to the excesses of slavery that continue to endure and survive in the sea through the legal status of the ship, the jurisdiction of ocean, 
existence and in the residence of time that continues to animate the now. Therefore, the ocean as archive draws critical attention to a neglected aspect of slavery's archive, to objects, artifacts, and imaginaries that invite alternative ways to enter the archive of the enduring and move us beyond the impasse of what can be said and what remains silenced in legal history of transatlantic slavery. So very fascinating, I find. So, and it, so really, the, it's not the anti-history. There's a lot you can learn about history on the mainland by studying the oceans, and particularly slavery as well. So moving to the slide, and we'll then we'll move to the comparison. So her institution, Department of Sociology at the University of British Columbia, position professor, in the as well as faculty associate the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies and faculty associate Social Justice Institute. Um, her teaching areas, law and society, historical methods, social and cultural theory, sociology of knowledge and culture, political philosophies of law and justice, research areas, colonial legal history, critical theory, race and racism, effect, time and temporality, oceans and maritime worlds, settler colonialism, and migration, colonial India, and diaspora, more than human worlds. Suggested readings across oceans of law, the Komagata Nehru, and jurisdiction in the time of empire, published in Durham by Duke University Press in 2018, and colonial proximities, cross-racial encounters, and juridical truths in British Columbia, published between 1970, or the years 1971 to 1921, published in Vancouver by the University of British Columbia Press, 2009. The logos we have on the top right, the University of Toronto, where she received her doctorate, in, and the uh, University of Br British Columbia, where she currently teaches. Her section is in part two, Approaches, Conceptualizing Legal History, chapter 16, Archival Legal History, Towards the Ocean as Archive, by Renisa Mawani, that's her name, and her quotes, lastly, first quote, in the limitless undulations and ceaseless change, oceans expand laws archive from words and text to objects, artifacts, spectres, and spirits. Next quote, the ocean as legal archive is material, figurative, and human, non-human. The sea has many surfaces, layers, and dimensions that demonstrate the materiality of law and legal violence in productive ways. Oceans have long been compete. next quote, oceans have long been completing sites of oppression and redemption, subjection and subversion, undulations that are vividly evident in his stories of transatlantic slavery. And last quote, the ocean as legal archive points to the excess of slavery that continued to endure and survive in the sea through the legal status of the ship and the jurisdiction, jur jurisdiction of oceans and the residence time that continues to animate the now. Very fascinating chapter and um, I think it's just a huge water mix up from 75 70 percent of the earth and, all, and what percent of law does it make up well i think it's completely intertwined so it's not like 70 percent it's not 30 percent it's 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 inseparable so moving to the comparison between the two in the style of plutarch's lives so between kathleen rena isabel schmidt and renisa mawani so similarity they both have a phd however Renisa Mawani's is completed and Katharina is in process. However, Katharina Isabel Schmidt is in the process of two, her Doctor of Judicial Studies or Juridical Studies at Yale and Doctor of History at Princeton, whereas Renisa Mawani's PhD was in the Center for Criminology and Sociological Studies at the University of Toronto. Additionally, Katharina Isabel Schmidt studied law at University College London, University Cologne, Oxford, and Yale. However, I could not find any details as to whether Renisa Mawani studied law. My guess is perhaps she did, maybe in, um, maybe internationally, I'm not sure which country, maybe in Canada, but nonetheless it was not listed, whereas Katharina Isabel Schmid definitively has studied in multi-countries, that being the United Kingdom, United States, Germany, yes, and those three. In terms of their academics, um, Renisa Mawani has produced already two books and however the uh, Katharina Isabel Schmidt has produced many articles but has not yet produced a book but once again she's also uh, still younger as well still completing her doctor stu doctorate studies. Their areas of interest are uh, different in that Katharina Isabel Schmidt and particularly the chapter started all the way back with Aristotle to the present whereas Renisa Mawani in the case of her uh, oceans as legal archives 
is from the 16th century onward. So the, the, the length of time doesn't necessarily make one better than the other, and I don't think anyone is any better than anyone else, but just the distinction there, one is a little longer time frame. Their interests are uh, rather different in that Renisa Mawani Mawa was focused in her chapter on oceans and seas, whereas Katharina Isabel Schmidt focused a lot more on I individuals, particularly uh, intellectual scholars or legal scholars over time. It was largely the focus of hers, whereas one was kind of oceans and seas, one was more of a people focus, and just laws that take place on the land. She didn't really address anything relating to oceans and seas. And then in terms of their the, their research interests, their, or particularly their chapters, one was focused on comparative legal history, where it covered the good, the bad, and the opportunities. However, Renisa Mawani was generally positive about the opportunities about Oceanus Archive, even though it might have might not be covering bad things. It's a positive, all around a positive thing, and there isn't really a, a down a downfall from studying it. it. Just you might find an, an unfortunate truths or unfortunate history. But a, a final similarity is that they both their chapters took place in locating legal history, and that's kind of the thing. well, that is what they both did. And overall, they're both two great scholars, and I hope that you uh, learn more about them and continue to support. So thank you so much for watching.